Iris Smart Cities. We are a European funded Horizon 2020 project on Smart City Solutions, part of the Smart Cities Lighthouse program, where uh, well, almost more than 100 cities are participating in. Um, the Iris Smart Cities project is a collaboration to make the cities of uh, the project a better urban place to live in. And we work with three lighthouse cities, Utrecht, uh, Gothenburg and Nice, where we do large scale demonstrations of integrated solutions that uh, that make life better in cities. And for fellow cities, uh, Vaza, uh, Foxani, Alexandropoulos and Santa Cruz de Tenerife, who follow the project from the start on and are now trying to or working on the replication of these smart city solutions demonstrated in the lighthouse cities. So this is a picture showing that in our project we work both locally. So on the left hand side you see a couple of pictures of the demonstration and replication areas in the lighthouse cities. We work locally with a consortia of uh, knowledge institutes, of, of uh, companies, of energy companies, grid operators, uh, public authorities uh, and citizens to develop uh, smart city solutions and uh, to demonstrate them to create uh, business models and scaling opportunities for them. But not only we are working on the local level, we also collaborate within this project with the, the fellow cities and all the lighthouse cities to see how can we learn from each other? Where can we uh, uh, try to, 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 to get the lessons that you learn when you implement or, 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 or walk across barriers when implementing smart city solutions? How can we benefit from the collaboration between each other? And finally, also try to replicate and scale up the solutions that we have implemented. Um, right now, we are working on a portfolio of at least uh, 50 different integrated solutions. We have structured the project into uh, five transition tracks, uh, where the first and the second transition track deal with the uh, integration of uh, uh, renewable energy at the district and the building level. We try to create flexibility in your energy system so we can take account of these uh, 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 new renewable energy sources. The third track deals with innovative mobility solutions. Uh, the fourth track deals with uh, urban data platforms and new information services. And the fifth one deals with citizen engagement. So how do we involve our citizens in co-creation of our solutions? Here so you see a snapshot of some of the, uh, the key solutions that we've developed in, in Gothenburg, for example, the award-winning sustainable energy building, positive energy building, the Bureau of FIFA building. Uh, in, in Nice, we are really the front runners in integrating uh, battery storage and uh, optimized collective self-consumption at the building and at the, at the cluster of buildings level. And finally, in Utrecht, uh, developing the vehicle-to-grid ecosystem uh, where we store electricity in uh, vehicles uh, to be used at later points during the day. Um, so the portfolio of, uh, of solutions is also found on our website, irissmartcities.eu. Um, furthermore, we have links to our YouTube channels uh, where we and other social media channels where we always try to develop a knowledge base for our replicable solutions. This knowledge base can be used by, by our project partners uh, in the federal cities, in the lighthouse cities, but also for uh, scaling up towards uh, all our other partners, for example, within the Smart Cities Lighthouse program, but specifically also beyond. So I invite you to take a look at, uh, at our website. Um, yeah, maybe quick uh, uh, takeaways for, for what we learned from the project, what I gather from, from our city partners uh, on, on, on their uh, takeaways. So first of all, it gives us the, the opportunity to, to, to reach a higher ambition in terms of, uh, of energy systems, in terms of mobility systems. Um, we learn quite a lot, uh, not always from the things that go well, but always from the things that go not so well, the things that are challenging, that, that gives us problems. Uh, this is a good project to, to, and, a, and a good arena to learn from these elements. City replication, I think this is one of the main topics also of today, together with uh, with upscaling. By doing this in one isolated demonstration area, it's not the reason why cities participate. We want to use this information to scale it up at other areas of our cities and um, 
through this project, we are learning on, on specific innovations that are demonstrated on how to do that. Uh, the topic of today, business modeling, is also one of the, the main drivers of this uh, area. So if you don't have a good bankable business model, upscaling will not take place. Uh, that's something you need to take into account from the start. And um, well, as I said, business models. Um, and of course, the transition. Uh, the project helps us to transition our cities from uh, yeah, taking, by integrating these new and novel technologies, by using the force of our citizens to create a transition towards uh, energy neutral and smart cities. And well, some of the districts, like this is a picture of inclusivity, and some of the districts in our project deal with social housing areas, deal with areas that, that have seen less investments in the past years than, than, than the more uh, central districts and cities. So by doing this project, we also learn how to be more inclusive in uh, the way we develop our city. Um, yeah, that's it. Maybe a very short and brief overview. Uh, please uh, uh, look at our website if you want more information. And for now, I wish you a very good and productive uh, and inspiring uh, workshop today. So I, uh, I thank you for your attendance and I would gladly to hand over to, uh, to Jonas for the, as, as moderator of the workshop. Thank you very much, Ro. What a great presentation. I was always impressed of this project myself, being a part member. <laughs> Maybe that's a bit uh, subjective. Thank you very much, Ro. <laughs> great to have you on board. Uh, let's share my screen. Let's see if we can do this. So here we go. Yes. Uh, thank you for the very smooth transition to my presentation. Yes, this workshop is all about uh, replication and upscale, and, and you neatly presented the two concepts. Replication is between cities and upscale is within the cities, uh, most likely between two districts uh, in the city. Uh, most development in cities uh, is conducted district by district, and, and the, the usual roadmap for for a, for an upgrade of a city or a development of a city is, is based on a number of districts. And so are we working as well here in in the Iris project in the lighthouse cities. Uh, and a what we used to say the there is an urgent need to speed up the transition towards the more sustainable uh, societies. And one of the fastest ways, is to, of course, to steal with pride or copy or replicate. So what we will present today is a methodology to, to uh, find out uh, the recipe for a successful solution in one city using a business model canvas, and then replicate this to your own city. And replicate between cities is one thing, but sometimes it's also important to do the very same thing when upscaling between districts in the same area, because uh, not always that the, the communication is that transparent and forward, and there can be a large group of different uh, actors involved who needs to understand the concept. And uh, today we have had the opportunity to uh, describe uh, with the Business Model Canvas a mobility as a service uh, solution established in Gothenburg, Sweden, by the easy to be company. Uh, and the CEO, Lennart Persson, is with us here today as well. And even though you presented a, a good picture of the IRIS project, uh, Ru, if we must uh, also mention that we are one out of 11 ongoing projects under the what is previously called the Smart Cities and Communities program, now uh, changed to the Smart Cities Marketplace. So replication and sharing knowledge is not just between the cities in IRIS. We also uh, have a collaboration with a large number of representatives from different cities and actors in, in Europe. And uh, 11 projects is ongoing, while there is a, a, a on the Smart Cities and Marketplace website, there's also a large uh, uh, number of presentations from uh, Finnish projects. When it comes to business modeling uh, and replication, it's important to remember that um, uh, the situation is, is, of course, different, even though we are all members in Europe, uh, uh, European Union, there's differences between the different uh, countries and, and uh, different cities. And we should also remember that this Irish Smart Cities project was actually designed 
by 43 partners from nine different European countries in 2016. And uh, in some areas, development has what has been quite fast, and it, it's very good to see that because it, it's uh, important that it, it has a good speed. But this also affects how we look at business model, value chains, and and, and the different market scenarios. So um, uh, the uh, the presentation today uh, about the easy to be solution. It, remember to say that even though this was conducted in 2020, I think this will, will change pretty fast, and and um, especially in this area of mobility as a service, as as that is a very important sector for most of the mobility uh, businesses. Uh, so there will be a number of new actors and a number of new solutions. So the uh, the business modeling activities need really to be adaptive and agile. And, and this is uh, the basics for the IRIS smart project. And uh, you presented this uh, uh, very well, uh, Ro, so I think I skipped this slide. Uh, and you also presented uh, the district perspective. Uh, in in uh, the lighthouse city Nice, we run a demonstration in a business area in the Netherlands. In, in Utrecht, uh, there is a district with residential areas, and in Sweden, we we combine residential and campus area, uh, and we try to connect the different buildings to build a district where the solutions are fully integrated both mobility solutions, energy solutions, and also the way the different stakeholders interact with each other. And as you say, we have come quite far with the replication. Uh, we have now been uh, engaged in this IRIS project for slightly more than three years. And the demonstrations are up and running in the right lighthouse cities. And the demonstration activities have now led to this kind of presentation we see today. Uh, business model canvases and setups and technical description then can be replicated or copied into the one of, or more of the four different uh, follower cities, Vasa, Fokshani, Alexandropolis, and Santa Cruz. In work packet three, the overarching and big uh, objectives for all of the cities is to develop bankable business models. And with bankable, we mean uh, solutions that uh, there is a low risk for investing into. And there is a number of uh, joint objectives for the cities here. We are supposed to deliver uh, more than uh, 30 new business models. We will present a number of enhanced business models, and we will also uh, point out how to increase the innovation management performance within each city. We are a team of experts and we have divided uh, a bit. Uh, some of us look out, uh, sort of study the, the smart city market and how to stimulate that with innovation uh, management. We uh, try to define the value chain on the marketplace, uh, the solution providers uh, that actually deliver the mobility as a service uh, to the end uh, users, and who are the solution suppliers. In this case, there is the easy to be is a typical solution supplier, while the the uh, property owner is a solution provider to the end user. And uh, enhancing existing business model, this is from another example uh, around this, the uh, the property uh, Viva, which we will learn more about today. We're looking to. Uh, uh, the value chain for, for a solution, we see that there is usually, uh, a, in this case, five well-established companies involved in delivering a new solution. So enhancing existing business model can be either with a work by existing uh, sort of established uh, businesses, but it can also including new innovative companies like easy to be And with that, I will like to present the uh, agenda for the workshop today. And uh, uh, the basis uh, or the uh, is a work conducted by uh, Palaskevic Jorka and Mark Sanders uh, with interviews uh, of the uh, uh, easy to be solution uh, and the different stakeholders using that solution. 
And from that uh, set of interviews, they have uh, put together a business model canvas, which will we learn more about today. And as it is a workshop, we have divided it into three sections where uh, we will discuss how to create value or present how to create value in the business model canvas, how to deliver value and how to capture value. And there will be a dialogue between uh, Paraskevi, Mark and Landmark uh, for these three sections. And um, I would very much like you all to write questions in the chat or raise your hand digitally. And at the, at the end of each uh, session, I will moderate this question with the presentations. Thank you very much. And I think I leave the floor to you then, uh, Ms. Paraskevi Bjorka. Thank you very much, Jonas, for the introduction. And I'm just going to share my screen. OK. Um, I hope this is OK for everybody. So good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Paraskevi Gyurka, and I'm working for the IRIS project at the Center for Research and Technology, ELAS and specifically the Chemical Process and Energy Resources Institute, SPERI. Um, as Jonas um, said, we have organized this webinar with uh, Mark Sanders so as to present a tool for designing business models adapted to a smart city context and uh, also illustrate an example, a real example of a business model that is designed for um, the EC2B uh, which uh, is, as Jonas has explained, a platform which basically offers mobility services of third parties, uh, giving property developers an argument to negotiate with the city government a rebate on the parking norm for new developments. So I would like to start um, with this introductory slide, which is some food for thought while you hear this, uh, this dialogue, uh, basically, that we have prepared, in which ways the smart city business model canvas can be useful for your case, or how do you intend to use it within the framework of IRIS project or outside IRIS project for your future business activities. Um, yeah, and what is the business model? I would like to start with briefly explaining this um, because sometimes um, we kind of uh, um, uh, have another idea of what a business model actually is. Now, business model actually describes the rationale of how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. And if one thinks that uh, the process of designing a business model is part of the business strategy, I would dare to say today that it is not just a part of business strategy, but it is the heart of it. And uh, what does this exactly mean? So here is the example. Regarding EC2B, but every other business that is creating a business model, value creation, uh, value basically can be created in two ways. First, by producing an offering that is worth more to the customers than its cost to produce. And then value must also be created and delivered to customers before any of it becomes available for capture by the company. And then the next step after we have created value is the value delivery stage. Well, this phrase is um, a bit of a misnomer, one could say, because it implies that all a company needs to do is to be willing and able to deliver something to be successful. But if we take more, a, a, a more customer-centric view, we will realize that the value is less delivered by the company and more accepted by the customers. So the ultimate decision to do the deal always lies with the customer and customers are willing to accept and use your value because of their awareness of your company, their belief that your offering will solve a problem 
that they have and their expectation of improved operations uh, by your solution. Then if we go to the next stage of this cycle, which is the value capture, this is the stage at which an organization gets paid. So now the question is how much of the total value one should take? Well, some simple math could dictate that um, you would get whatever amount is left by subtracting your costs of value creation and delivery from the offering's sales price. But most of the times it's not so simple because of other considerations such as your competitor's pricing, for example, or your longer term market strategy. So are there any tools that are available to us to help us design these three very important stages, the value creation, value delivery, and value capture? The, the standard tool that we have is the business model canvas, which is which was initially proposed in 2005 by Alexander Oster Walder and Eve Spigner. But since then, we have seen a lot of adaptations for different niches. And the, the, the classical business model canvas is uh, basically composed of nine uh, basic uh, building blocks that includes the customer segments, the value proposition, identifying the channels through which we reach customers, and what relationships do customers expect from us, and uh, helps us identify also who are the key partners and what are the key activities that needs to be performed, and we, what key resources we need to perform those activities. And then, of course, it helps us to identify the cost structure and the revenue streams. So this is a tool that can capture this uh, chain, the, the value chain of create, delivering and capturing value. Now, within the framework of the IRIS uh, Smart City project, we have adapted the classical business model canvas to the Smart Cities business model canvas. and. This tool has uh, 12 plus two uh, building blocks uh, that we are going to present today and try to link it with the example of the business model of from uh, EC2B. Now, this tool helps us also to identify the environmental and the social impact of smart city solutions that sometimes can be the key um, to deciding on investing to smart city uh, projects. So let's start explaining those building blocks and uh, try to link them, as I said, uh, with the currently being developed uh, business model by EC2B. And uh, with the help of uh, Mark Sanders, who has done the analysis based on the data collected from EC2B, and of course, Leonard Person, uh, who is also representing EC2B, uh, who can intervene and discuss any pivots that have occurred uh, since the interviews took place. So I'm going to start with the first building block, which is the network beneficiaries. In this box, we try to map all the target users in the network of the smart city ecosystem for whom value is created for and whose needs are addressed through a smart city solution. Now, the purpose in that network is that the network beneficiaries are actually identified early in the process and are engaged in the co-creation of the smart city solutions. Uh, Mark, for the case of the EC2B, can you please tell us which target users is the value created for? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Vivi, for that clear introduction of the of the of the method that, that we developed and uh, and I'm very glad that Leonard is here to uh, uh, basically um, add to what I have to say because of course we did this this analysis of, of the EC2B uh, business model uh, back in the summer of uh, 2020 and although that is recent it also means that uh, things are moving fast in this sector and I hope that Leonard can uh, can give us the latest uh, when I say things that have been have to be updated. 
Um, right. So um, it's your question about the network beneficiaries. Uh, who's in the network? It's, it is rather a complex uh, business model uh, that EC2B is uh, is trying to develop because it has many uh, many beneficiaries, many partners, and many different types of value being created. Um, so first of all, there's the city itself. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, well, there's now a, a pilot going on in Gothenburg that we studied, and uh, in Lund. Uh, both in Sweden, and of course, in the end, uh, with the mobility as as a service, the 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 value being created in the end for the end user is getting from A to B in a well and fitting way. But the end users using the services are not really the focus of the business model. Um, the the network beneficiaries for uh, for EC to B primarily is the property developer. Uh, the property developer can get this. Uh, from the city, this rebate on, on the parking lawn. So it's all interacting in, in very complex ways, uh, also spread out in time. Uh, you have to make the offer to the property developers at the, at the stage they're developing, uh, or actually they're planning the development uh, with the city and negotiating the parking lawn. So it is, uh, there's, there's many beneficiaries in the, in the network that uh, obtain different, uh, different benefits. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right then. So thank you, thank you, Mark. Uh, Leonard, please jump into into the discussion and comment uh, if anything uh, you would like to. If there's anything you would like to add at any time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting to be here and discuss this. And I think this is a really good development of the Osterwalders. Um, business model that, that that you try to focus on these network beneficiaries and as Mark said uh, at yeah a year ago uh, the business model from EC 2 b had a certain number of actors and uh, since then it hasn't been less complex because we have added more actors in to the to the business model but we, we also go to uh, more markets now but, but um, as a business model, I think it's really, really good to to have this box with network beneficiaries. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Leonard. So let's move on to the next one, which is about value proposition. Uh, then now, value proposition basically refers to the benefits each actor in the network creates for a single or multiple end users in the network. Which, which basically means that the value proposition addresses the specific needs of one or more end users and provides ex a, a clear explanation of how these needs will be satisfied. So in our case, for the EC2B model, Mark, what value does each actor deliver? Yeah, so, so in essence, EC2B offers a platform, uh, an online platform in which you can uh, basically uh, reserve uh, a mobility as a service uh, solution um, as an end user in, the, um, in, in, in a building, in a, in a, in a property. Um, so that's, that's what it is. Um, and that delivers value, obviously, to that, uh, to that end user because uh, you can get from A to B in a convenient way. Uh, but it also offers value to, um, to the property developer because it is a one-stop solution, uh, a service they can offer their tenants. Uh, and then basically that justifies having lower, um, lower parking norms for that, for that particular uh, property. That creates value for the property developers because they can save money uh, by having less uh, parking facilities uh, in the development. And then that is important for the city because they have ambitions towards having less congestion, having less pollution and having more sustainable uh, transportation in the city. So there's a, there's a chain of very different value propositions, let's say, uh, interacting in this, uh, in this business model. Then there is, of course, the suppliers of these uh, mobility services. It's important to realize that uh, ECTB is not offering the services themselves. They are offering a platform on which others can offer their mobility services. So that also links um, these service providers, uh, the electric car provider, the um, electric bike provider, the 
public uh, public transportation companies they all resell their resell their services through this platform and thereby also for them there is a value proposition in in having access to this additional channel for their um, for their services and so very different types of value being created by different um, actors in this network mm -hmm. but mark um regarding the end users which problem are is is it to be trying to solve for them yes yeah, so that that depends a bit on who you define to be your end user um from the interviews i got the impression that at least uh, last summer for ec to be um the end user was the the property developers and they uh they faced a problem or they they get the value from being able to convince uh, the city to allow them a significant parking norm rebate um, and if that is your end user then that means you need to satisfy their um, let's say demands as you explained earlier uh, for you to be able to capture the value you have to deliver uh, the value to that customer uh, and then they are supposed to buy into your proposition um, and that is still uh, very much an under development in this uh, in this business model in the two pilots that uh, that uh, that were discussed uh, with with the various uh, let's say actors from the network we got the, um, the impression that uh, well, currently they're not paying for the services of ectb it's being um, it's being subsidized basically by iris and by um, and and these property developers uh, appreciate the service and they're but they're also very much involved in co-creating and developing it with ectb to become a viable proposition. Mm -hmm. um, okay. As a as a as a service, I don't know if that has changed, Leonard. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this question we can talk about all day, and it gets more and more interesting. More or less, I mean, throughout Europe, we have the same challenges with urbanization. We have more dense cities, and this thing with digitalization which creates possibilities to, uh, if we then add a business model th th then it creates a possibility for this shared mobility to be a part of the solution for sustainable development and uh, now we are talking about in brf viva where we're talking about a new property on on uh, if you say in on the ground that wasn't built on before but what we are discussing now is that when Gothenburg, at least, and we're discussing with a lot of other cities as well, they, they, they want to make a more dense city. And where can we build them? Well, we don't want to build on the green areas because we want to get rid of the privately owned car and get more into shared mobility. Okay, then we should build the new properties on existing parking lots. And this mm -hmm. is when it gets really interesting now with the business model and this value proposition because what happens then you take away existing parking places you get le less parking places for uh, already existing properties and you add more property so there is where our business model is going in one direction and the other thing that we're working with if you now refer as uh, end users we're working with um, with corporate mass that that we're working with uh, with companies and they want their employees to um, to travel uh, both with business trips and to and from their work uh, in a more sustainable way so so iris has i'm very glad that we are doing this and that we are a part of this uh, project because we have been doing a lot of replicates uh, or, uh, already okay. mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Leonard, for um, indicating how the business model has evolved and is applicable in other cases as well that you are already considering. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one. Uh, well, the next building block in the smart city business model canvas is about data. And actually, we specifically inserted this box because uh, data is nowadays becoming increasingly essential, actually. Uh, in how we realize the improvement of uh, smart cities. 
And data can be from various sources. It can be from sensors and connected infrastructures and uh, devices, uh, as well as uh, we can have data on how end users interact with this infrastructure and the connected devices. Um, this alone can also create some business opportunities. Some data can be provided to third parties to develop other uh, services um, in the overall context of, cre of improving city living. So, um, Mark, do you think that there is any data that will be made available from the EC2B services designed either for third parties or for the city itself to become smarter in a way regarding uh, managing traffic, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the data is, of course, the new gold. Um, and and this, this business model generates data as a, as a kind of side product. If, if, you're, if you're operating these platforms, I'm assuming uh, you, you can also track the, uh, the mobility habits of tenants. Um, and in that sense, that's valuable information. Um, coming from the Netherlands, I'm not sure how that's different across Europe, but um, there, there would immediately be raised some uh, some privacy uh, flags and issues. Um, it is, of course, hi also highly uh, sensitive information, uh, how people move about and, and, and what choices they make. But uh, I guess appropriately anonymized, uh, this kind of data would be valuable um, as, a, as a resource for, for others um, in the city, in planning the, uh, the mobility uh, uh, in the future, as well as uh, for, for EC2B in, uh, in planning and, and, let's say, validating their, their business and business model. Um, whether it is actually a, a possible way of making additional, you know, tapping additional revenue streams, I don't think that is a very big um, a, a very big opportunity in this particular business model. Um, also, because you, you would risk, um, yeah, you would risk uh, the value that you're creating for the end users by by using their data uh, for different purposes. So, it, I would I would be very cautious with that mm -hmm. uh, in this particular case. But maybe Leonard can also briefly uh, reflect on that. Yes, Leonard, have you thought about using the data that is generated by by the platform and how how would you plan to do it? Uh, to, to be extremely clear, uh, we don't, uh, as you said, Mark, uh, and we, we are not, um, uh, we have transport service providers, carpooling, bicycles and so forth, and we don't have a GPS connected to the EC2B application. We are not following how our users are traveling through the, through the city. So, so that, that is really important and we don't talk to the transport service providers to say that you have to hand us this data. But of course we know when, uh, how much they have rented a bicycle when they are using uh, public transport and so forth. So this kind of data are we using, of course, to, to make offers and so forth. And uh, I mean, in, in the mobility as a service, uh, there are different, if you have seen this uh, scale, at the top level, uh, the city maybe could say that today there is an inversion, um, uh, the, the air is really bad, and we will offer you free public transport today. And if there, there is a big platform that could go out to the end users. But that's a different story and in the future. Mm -hmm. So there are considerations, but um, concerns the future of how you're gonna you 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 will be utilizing uh, this type of data, um, also compli in compliance with the GDPR, of course. Um, okay, mm -hmm. then let's move on to the deployment uh, channels, which is the next uh, building block. And uh, the deployment channels basically refer to how a company communicates, distributes, and sells its services and products to the customers. So what is really important here to identify is through what channels the beneficiaries, the end users, uh, are most likely to learn uh, about the smart city solutions solution that we offer. So, for the case of the EC2B, through which channels is the company trying to reach customers? 
and um, uh, how how do you plan to do it? Uh, oh. Mark, can you please provide the first answer, and then Leonard can complement. Yeah, so from the interviews, uh, it, it was clear that um, the end user in the in the business model and, 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 and that ec 2 is, is, is reaching uh, are property developers in cities rather than uh, their tenants uh, and the occupants of the buildings. Um, these people are, uh, and, and this is what one of the property developers also said, uh, there is a scarcity of housing and uh, it's also a very small part of the total housing offer in cities like Gothenburg and Lund. So there is self-selection of these end users. There will be only tenants that want to, or don't need to own a car and want to use these uh, these services. There will be self-selection. So they're, they're not too worried about um, uh, reaching the, the, the end end users, that is the users of the services. But rather, they need to make sure that uh, property developers and cities are aware of this opportunity, of this possibility of offering this service instead of creating uh, parking uh, space. Um, and that then also needs to be allowed by cities. So it's it's um, in terms of deployment channels and, and offering, bringing the value to the customer, uh, the big challenge for ec will be to be, um, let's say, top of mind at the stage of development, at the stage of negotiations when when these decisions are being made between the property developers and the cities, uh, the city officials, um, and that is a much more difficult way. Uh, I mean, it, it's not like you, you advertise, but rather uh, it, the channels that were mentioned in the interviews were webinars like this one, uh, innovation seminars, uh, events where you can showcase your solution and then attract the attention of, of these uh, of these end users or let's say intermediate end users mm -hmm. and um, since the time that the interviews were conducted leonard have you thought of um, any specific channels that are integrated with the customer routines in order to maximize the potential to reach them yeah, one thing that's very important i think for 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 all of life is that you have incentives because if there's the wrong business model from a tenant, then the incentive could be zero uh, because we are not sharing the profits. Then uh, the incentive for us is to have a product that is used as uh, little as possible. So, so it's very important to discuss that. Uh, how, how do we make these incentives so there's a win-win solution? Uh, even for the end users, for the tenant, the property owners, and for easy to be and its partners, uh, and we are also working with in incentives with the uh, with the transport service providers that we get kickbacks from each other. Uh, when you discuss this with the city and the property owners, uh, I think that we are also working with the city to discuss with them because it's very important uh, for the city to understand and make um, a stand in their traffic strategies. Do do your city think that shared mobility is a part of the solution in sustainable mobility and the su sustainable development of the city? And if it is so, then they also have to work even harder, not only to put in to put projects, but they are also a big tendering uh, organization. They can change the parking norms, the mobility norms and so forth to make this uh, shared mobility stick. So uh, yeah, you can uh, answer this in different levels. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, now uh, it's time for a short break. Uh, we have planned um, at, we have planned this at uh, ten forty-five. Uh, we are a bit a few minutes late, but uh, I guess Jonas, um, we are back um, around eleven or eleven o five. Uh, no, 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 well, not Central European time. It's five, five to ten here in yes, Sweden. Yes, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I was referring so to before the we take the break, uh, if Palaskevi uh, and Mark, if you look into your chat, uh, you yep. see that we have two questions. One from uh, okay. Mika Hakasolo. Can you see that? Isn't the yes. end user the person? Yeah. Would any of you would yes, like so to? 
Yeah, so so in, in the end, that, that would also be my, uh, let's say, first um, first response, first intuition. Of course, the end user of the mobility as a service is the mobility user, the, the, the car owner who needs to switch to um, switch to uh, shared mobility and, and, and other modes of transportation. Um, and so, so I was also uh, maybe a bit surprised to, uh, to but then uh, quickly reassured um, that in the business model of EC2B, uh, there is these steps in between and these partners in between uh, that end user, where of course in the end, that is the value that is being created, getting from A to B in a, in a convenient and fitting way. Um, and in the end, that needs to, that that need will have to be satisfied for this business model to be sustainable in the long run. But in the short run, it looked like um, uh, the, the 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 largest, let's say, willingness to pay for this integrated solution for tenants uh, could be found uh, easiest uh, with the property developers uh, in, in case they were were offered a rebate by the city. So it's a little bit more complex uh, to then uh, uh, position everybody well in the in the business model campus. Thank you, Mark. And then you have a second question from uh, Peta Turtianen. Uh, who was the model actually created? How was the model actually created? Did you organize workshops with all the different stakeholders? No, it was interviews, wasn't it? Well, if, the, if this question is directed to uh, EC2B, asking them about how they actually created their business model, I could not answer that as well as Leonard could. But in terms of filling in the, the canvas, what we did indeed was we interviewed uh, not only EC2B uh, employees, but also uh, their network partners. So we, we interviewed the property developers, we interviewed the service providers, uh, the public transportation company, the city, um, or actually the, um, I think, Johanna Berg, uh, the city district manager. Uh, so all the, the, the partners um, were, uh, were interviewed. Um, what we did not do for this particular uh, business model canvas is actually interview one of the tenants, because at the time, I don't think we had access to, uh, to them. I'm, I'm not sure the properties were already uh, rented out. Um, at that time, but it was very early on in the process that we did the interview, so we could not uh, reach any of those uh, partners. So that's that's. Would you like to? Would you like to comment? Uh, how briefly? Uh, but how did you start, or how we have you con sort of developed your business idea into a business model? Have you arranged workshop, or is it? Lennart, are you with us? Yeah, yeah. So, sorry, C come again. So uh, we have a question. Yeah. And how was the model actually created? Did you organize the workshops with all the different stakeholders? Uh, uh, for ECB, have you uh, many of the stakeholders on uh, so sort of at this stage, but when you when you started out, was it just a business idea, and then you launched it and and go with the flow or did you have arranged any workshops or bigger meetings to to present your workshops and the basics yeah no uh, it's like a startup company we we i mean we are fully owned by travector which is a consultant firm and we started it because we had made so many surveys and investigations and we didn't see that any anyone was doing anything so we said that let's make a startup company and we made it pretty easy while, oh, while building this business model because we know that you have to have a viable business model in the beginning and then it evolves and that's what's okay. happening now. Super, mm -hmm. so uh, it's a great opportunity. We, we, we like spin outs uh, working as startups because then you have a good backbone to work from. So thank you very much for the first session, uh, everybody. And as you said, Paraskevi, we will have a, a seven minute break. So five minutes past your time here in Sweden, it's five minutes past 10 and in Greece, it's five minutes past 11. Is that okay, Paraskevi?
Yes, that's great. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much.
Welcome back, Laura, Leonard. The first session was okay. Uh, question to me. The first first half of this workshop was okay. Not it's not supposed to be a hot chair for you. It's supposed to be a discussion. So I feel. <laughs> and uh, uh, I will try to, to make sure that uh, it's not scrutinize your business model. But this is an example on how to present a business model, your business model, to be able to replicate it and upscale it. So. I think we have a good discussion. And if you keep this in mind, replication, upscaling, uh, I think uh, next session uh, about uh, delivering value and capture value will be very interesting. Yeah, I will try to keep that in mind. Just please adjust if I'm talking too much and in the wrong direction because oh. I also want to like to have yeah, this as good as possible. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. And do you agree, Mark and Paraskevi? I yeah. just came in, but I think I do. We're still on um, on record, huh? Yeah, I think so. I say that we we are in the first session. We have spoken about create value. We will now in the next session speak about deliver value and capture value. And I think the business model canvas, as as you presented, is is a very good showcase on on how to pinpoint the the as a important aspects for replication and upscaling. Because this is, of course, so what we've spoken about, the, the different stakeholders uh, for creating value. This is the one that you need to be in mind when, when you replicate, but also when you upscale. Who is sort of, it's not, I mean, in a big city, maybe you need to be, speak to new city representatives when you enter a new area. That's important to remember. Sometimes not, uh, sometimes the organization is divided into districts and so on. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. My colleague Ulrika you said that be beware of that you are on the recording, but uh, I think this is a, a not a this is a, a comment for everybody. Replication and upscale is is a core core discussion here, and I think you are doing a great job. And uh, feel free to continue, Paraskevi. Okay, everyone, welcome back to this uh, second uh, part of the webinar. Um, in which we will be presenting how the business model is uh, delivering and capturing value. And uh, I would like to comment to what uh, Jonas um, has just said uh, about the replicability, which we are going to discuss a little bit more in the next few slides. Uh, it's quite important that uh, Leonard provides us with uh, the real case example of how a business model continuously um, updates and adapts to the conditions that are reforming uh, in a city. Uh, and um, this is why um, perhaps a tool could be useful uh, in order to organize all this kind of information that you, uh, we need to depict uh, in order to uh, create the business case and uh, run the business activities. So, okay, we will, we will talk a little bit more on the replicability issues later on. And let's move on to the next uh, main building block, which is about the key actors. And this block re basically refers to the players in the network um, and the form of cooperation uh, between them. The purpose of this box is basically to identify um, to identify all the key actors quite early in the process in order to maximize any potential co-creation that can happen uh, between them. So it, the, the cooperation can be either formal, of course, or non-formal uh, in a smart city ecosystem. And the, the key actors can refine in this way the allocation of the resources that each one brings in the project and are available and can refine also the activities so they can share infrastructure at least between the city and the solution provider and this results in reducing the risk especially in cases where large investments in infrastructure is required and, and this perhaps becomes an incentive 
for more actors to participate in the process and be actively uh, engaged. So in our case uh, that we are presenting in the EC2B business case, uh, who are the key actors, Mark? Well, so as I said, the, the, the key offering, let's say, is, is this platform and then it's the, the partners around that that, uh, that, that all uh, get integrated in, in, the, in the business model. So the, the key actors, of course, EC2B and its parent firm, uh, Trifactor, uh, which is still involved uh, very, very heavily, I think, in, the, in developing the, the business. Um, that, that's the center of the network, uh, but that the, there's key roles for the, for as I said, uh, in, in the cases that we investigated, uh, Lund and Gothenburg, Viva, uh, the property developers uh, are central actors in, in, this, uh, in this business model. They closely uh, uh, are closely aligned, let's say, and, and closely in interaction with the city. Uh, the cities uh, in, in these cases uh, that play a key role because if they don't move uh, the whole business model basically won't uh, fly um, and then there is uh, the the service providers that work on the platform and deliver their services to the end users in the in the, in the properties being developed so it's a in that sense um, a rather complex uh, and and large group of uh, of key actors that need to be uh, brought together and managed and of course the as you said uh, that that gives a lot of scope for co-creation of uh, of different kinds of value in different uh, in different ways it also increases complexity and in increases very much also the need for uh, let's say a high trust uh, relationships um, and then uh, we, we will come to speak about that more uh, in, in this part of the presentation but that also affects of course the scope for replicability and scale-up, um, maybe more even replicability outside uh, the, the familiar context than uh, scale-up uh, in adjacent areas. But uh, it, it, it affects this uh, uh, potential for the business model. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have referred before in the key suppliers, but this box uh, is aimed specifically to identify who are the key suppliers um for the business uh, so in this case mark and uh, then i would like to ask also leonard uh, leonard if you have identified other key actors in general or suppliers that came up in the process yeah so i i think one 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 that we haven't mentioned before and and was also not mentioned a lot in the in the in the interview so i'm i'm, I'm curious also to hear leonard's take on that is is in order to develop uh, the, the, the business model and in order to de deliver the value, uh, you need a very uh, well integrated and, and functioning uh, software platform. So I'm, I'm guessing, I'm assuming that there's also suppliers at that end uh, that, that play a key role or an important role. Um, and there were some remarks in the interviews about that uh, platform not yet being fully integrated. Uh, Leonard, you also indicated earlier you're not collecting the data on the, on the transportation itself so it's a it's a platform in which um, the end users are referred to uh, let's say the websites and, and sales channels of the of the uh, associated service providers could could you reflect a little bit on the on that side of the, um, the business model uh -huh. <clears throat> As you say, it, it is a complex model. It, it's several stakeholders in, that, in this. And if we start at the transport service providers side on that side, I mean, their business models are, not, uh, are often not adjusted to, to, uh, to integrate to uh, mobility as a service provider. They don't want to move down, if you say so, in the value change chain. They want to be talk directly to the end user or the property owner. So it is a challenge, as you say. So with some actors, transport service providers, we are fully integrated and uh, with others, we are not. But we are working there and trying to find incentives. And, and what we are saying then 
as a mobility as a service company, you, you can make your advertising on our platform. We are not trying to hide you, not showing your brand. We are, we are exposing your brand to a bigger market. That, that's what we are trying to do then. Um, if we see um, uh, on, on the other side, um, there is also, as you say, a lot of key actors within the city. And as Yuna said uh, earlier on, there is a lot of um, uh, development projects going on in Sweden and um, city development projects. And, and th there is a several actors that are, are combined and, and they are working together and, and to find out a really good way how they could organize themselves to be some kind of entity that could make a tender for these kind of service. There, there is also a challenge at the moment. And uh, we are working with several uh, development uh, projects at the moment, but, but that is not uh, mature, mature at all uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, and I think uh, it's, if you look then at replicability and, and upscaling, I think it, it's the same challenges uh, throughout Europe. And I think that, um, that we can learn from each other. And we have learned a lot from BRF Viva and also the other days uh, mobility service that we have launched at the campus Johanneberg, which is a corporate mass. But this we can have a different webinar on. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Leonard and uh, Mark. And you have um, mentioned uh, actors and the relationships uh, of the actors, which is about the next building block in the business model canvas. And uh, this uh, is, um, is quite crucial as well, as you also mentioned, Leonard, because there are a lot of different actor relationships that need to be orchestrated together in order to uh, continuously co-creating this value and uh, also engage the end users, the participants, those who are using the service and the clients, of course, in your case, which are two different things. Uh, to, to participate and evaluate continuously the, the business, that the, the, the solution that is offered in order to be improved. So there are a lot of relationships with the different actors and uh, with the city itself. So it is quite a complicated story. And uh, from your experience, uh, um, Leonard, uh, how do you think that this could be even more facilitated in a smart city context because of the number of the actors that are participating in such projects. And if you want, please comment on what type of relationship each actor is expecting from the solution provider. Yeah, it's a very, very big uh, questions. But uh, I mean, if, if you cut to the chase in some sense that if you and some of your friends are making a tender for something, uh, then you need to have the business model. Okay, how shall this work? Who have the risk uh, if we want to add more mobility into this? Uh, if we want to exclude? Uh, if there are damage done to the yeah the vehicles and so forth? So, so, so th there's a lot of challenges within this collaboration. Uh, so it's quite easy to make, yeah, to understand it in, in, in that sense. And, and to have some organization modeling how you can do this in, 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 in two or three ways. Not make it too complex. I think it, you can make it uh, pretty easy. But a couple of free uh, ways to, to organize, to make this tender and, and use share, share mobility. Mm -hmm. I think it's something Yes. Okay. And uh, thank you, Leonard. And Mark, what's your opinion on that? What are the actors' relationships, and what type of relationship each actor is expecting uh, in such business cases within a smart city context? Do you think? Well, I, I think specifically for for this business uh, business model and for this, these cases that that we researched. 
what clearly came out of the uh, of the interviews regarding the actual relationships is that that all of this is taking place very much in um, in a very high trust environment and there is a lot of appreciation also for the uh, for the uh, the expertise and the reputation of uh, a trifactor and then by by implication also the people working for uh, for EC2B I think that was an important aspect of uh, of, of the the relationships uh, involved um, because then you can you can yeah you you can go ahead you can move ahead and try things and pilot out things and and, and do things uh, that you haven't completely covered in in uh, you know, in contracting and in, in negotiating everything into the into the little grit, nitty gritty details, and I think that's really important in 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 the success of of piloting uh, these type of solutions and, and developing business models. So there there needs to be some room for 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 tinkering, let's say, uh, as you go uh, and and develop the uh, the, the relationships uh, in in the network. Um, and it's also uh, on the side of the of the service providers. I think it was already shown that uh, the, the, there is quite a bit of flexibility in terms of you can integrate other providers. I think uh, was it in Viva that uh, that the, the car provider, the share the car sharing provider was was switched somewhere midstream yeah. from one company to another. Uh, yeah. So having the flexibility to do that. Uh, as as it as it happens to become urgent uh, is also important. So yeah, it's a complex network of uh, of relationships that needs to be maintained uh, in in developing this particular business model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. Let's uh, thank you very much, both uh, both of you. And let's move to the next one, which is about the key actors' offerings. And I know that both of you have already referred to what each actor in the um, EC2B uh, case is offering, uh, but uh, this box uh, basically serves uh, the purpose of uh, identifying or updating continuously what is the offering of each actor participating uh, in the business case. So um, would you like to add anything on that? Um, I think you have already mentioned a few things. Um, what about you, Mark? Yes, well, so with the business model canvas, if, if you start working with it, um, this, this was also the feedback I got from uh, from the, the students uh, that, that helped me do this, uh, these interviews and do this analysis, is you, you'll see that there is also quite a bit of overlap between the different boxes and that's that's fine. So we've, we've already talked about uh, the, the value proposition coming from the different actors mm -hmm. and of course this, this is closely related to what the the actors offer in the network, um, but I think if you if you split it out again uh, along the actors that we have identified, it starts really and this this cannot be stressed enough. It starts with the let's say the, the policy innovation in the city. There needs to be a, a, let's say an urgent policy desire to do something about uh, congestion and parking and uh, po pollution and, and car ownership in the city so if it needs to start from there um and then you can you can start to, uh, making the case to the property developers that you have a service that uh, that can provide an alternative uh, to uh, relatively expensive parking facilities and then you can start uh, delivering your uh, uh, offering your service from the let's say the core of the business model to uh, to the property developers as uh, as the recipients of that uh, offering. Um, so it's 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 a, an interesting and kind of interrupted value chain. Let's say um, it's 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 not the value from the end users attached to having mobility that goes up the value chain all the way to the uh, to the initial actor offering the solution to that problem but it's it's kind of a cross of uh, of, of offerings uh, in this particular business model and mm -hmm. of course there's the, the service providers that are connected through the platform to the end users that's the line let's say where the value is offered uh, and where the key offering is the mobility service 
but it's it's integrated and it comes together in this in this hub that is the EC two B um, integrated solution for this uh, for this uh, problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Thanks, Mark. Um, let's move on to the next one, the next building block, which is about key resources and the infrastructures. And uh, well, key resources basically refer to what are those most important assets that are necessary for a business model to create and offer the value proposition that it promises. And um, also how the key resources can help to reach our markets and how it, they can help us to maintain the relationships with our customers while earning, of course, the, um, the expected revenues. Now, in the case of the smart city business model canvas, uh, the key resources sometimes also refer to physical, human, intellectual and financial assets, of course. Uh, for example, public buildings can be, uh, or the energy grid um, as well, can be uh, some of the physical assets, uh, but also the political will towards the transition of, uh, to a smart city era includes the necessary human assets and also encompasses uh, the retention that all stakeholders need to, uh, need to have to operate the city at its full potential. So the key resources or the key infrastructure that is required for the EC to be to realize the, its value proposition, what is it for this case, Mark? As it, it, it ties in interestingly with a question that Mika just posted in, uh, in the chat also, um, asking about smaller cities. I think all the, uh, almost all the interviewees that, that we interviewed mentioned that uh, that, that a dense urban area with uh, with uh, with good public transportation uh, facilities and and the option to also use uh, to use uh, bikes e-bikes and, and and even walking infrastructure is is essential or at least very important for uh, for for creating the value with uh, with the ECTB solution. Um, if, if you are in a in a uh, environment in which uh, having a car is simply the only option, then uh, the ECTB solution is not going to be very valuable uh, um, to the end users, uh, and thereby, by implication, it's going to be hard to to, um, to basically implement that solution. So that that was one thing that was mentioned a lot. Um, having the the infrastructure of a dense urban area. Uh, uh with with appropriate uh, well with with good public transportation facilities was one key resource that was mentioned i think on on as you mentioned uh, the, the human side um what everybody what many of the people we talked to in the network also mentioned is the the expertise and reputation and 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 also Connected to that, the trust in uh, in Trifactor and, and ECTP as being experts on uh, on traffic and traffic uh, consultancy and sustainable traffic solutions in general in Sweden. So that let's say that reputation, but also that expertise and that human factor is also a key resource that was mentioned. Um, and let me think. And finally, yeah, I mentioned also the, the cultural attitudes. Um, so we had we had a discussion with uh, with one of the property developers about could, could this be done elsewhere and, uh, and and if so under what conditions and then it was also discussed that it's important that um, at least there is no strong cultural let's say uh, resistance against uh, sharing cars uh, if you have a culture in which there is strong feelings towards owning your own a car and and having your own mobility, and then it becomes uh, it becomes hard to uh, to convince people to switch uh, to this to this new way of uh, of thinking about mobility. But if I think about my my own uh, father, for example, and and how he feels about being independent and having his own car on the driveway, it, that's not a target group. Um, you want to have very uh, very much represented in the area in which you're trying to uh, to make this uh, make this business model fly. 
mm -hmm. absolutely um all right that uh, takes us to the next building block and uh, the next building block is about the key activities and um, key activities refer to the management and the delivery of activities by the actors involved in the solution and uh, this of course uh, includes the capitalization of everybody's offerings uh, in the network and in, in the value proposition so can the city provide the platform for discussing and devising ways of collaboration among the actors uh, and the city of, uh, itself, of course. Uh, Mark, what do you think? Yeah, so it, 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 as I said, it's a, it's a complex network, network business model um, and that comes out of the, uh, the interviews. And it, it means that there, there could be an important role for the city as, a, as, as, as offering a platform for, for, for basically having the discussions and having the the relationships uh, um, being developed in order to have this business model uh, uh, going on. Um, as I said, it, it starts, as I said earlier, with the key resources. I mean, whether you want to call it a resource or an activity, um, it starts with the, the city's ambition to, uh, to have more mobility as a service and have sharing as part of the solution. If, if that's not uh, there, then... Uh, and, and, and the city is not developing activities uh, to promote that, then, uh, then it's going to be really hard sell uh, to develop this solution. Um, and then, of course, even more proactively, the city can definitely do a lot to promote uh, a business model like that of ECTB. Um, it's going to be complicated, I guess, uh, for, for, city, for cities to promote specifically uh, the solution of one company and one business model. That is tricky, um, but they, they can of course uh, make sure that there is an open uh, an open podium, let's say, for for people, people, businesses, companies offering these kind of services to property developers in the city, and and make it top of mind for those property developers to also consider that. So that there is definitely a, an important role for the the city to play in integrating these. Uh, these, these networks and business models in, in the city. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, in response to that, or in addition to that, or there is also key activities for ECTB to be being, uh, being active in that, uh, being visible in that, and, and trying to build uh, a reputation, I think, um, in, in terms of the, it depends a little bit on who the end users are that you're trying to reach, but especially if you're trying to reach professional end users like property developers or corporates, uh, as Leonard was, was referring to earlier, you, you need to build or maintain uh, a very strong reputation of being a reliable uh, business partner for these, uh, for these companies, um, making good on your promises. So that, that is then, I guess, a key activity for ECTB. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Leonard, would you like to comment on that? Uh, what were your the key activities that uh, were required by your side in developing uh, the business model and the business case? Yeah, well, well, it, we, we are moving uh, in different scales now uh, within business models and business models for the for the city as a, as a whole. But uh, we we can conclude at least that that mobility as a service is a complex thing and the key activities is not only to address uh, the end user or the property owners, you need to work on different levels. But because what it all comes back to is the main belief is shared mobility a part of the solution for a sustainable development. And if you come to that uh, conclusion, then the city very uh, easily can or the society can address in tenders, in the parking and the mobility norms and so forth, the, the, the growth of, of these kinds of services. Uh, so, so the key activities for us is to work on different levels. We have to find new customers to try to make the company not go bankrupt. 
and we need to work with uh, the city to yeah to, mm -hmm, to make mm -hmm. it possible make it tangible okay and here is the, the the main block which can help you you know note down quickly and adapt any key activities that you plan for now or in the future so mm -hmm. that uh, leads us to the next uh, building block which is about the revenue streams and of course Parents revenues refer yes yes jonas uh, are we not ready with the deliver value section yes yes and yes we are to the capture value yeah so of and, course uh, are there any questions <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> uh, thank you very much very interesting to listening in to this uh, all of you and and i must say lanat i think you're a, a bold entrepreneur and uh, this is a we are now listening to the classic someone should question <laughs> and uh, then you took your hat on and, and became that someone and, and it's uh, being a pioneer isn't very uh, sort of uh, glamorous all the time but but you're doing a great job and i i am happy to be a part of this project to be able to uh, assist you uh, as a partner in, in in the best way so we, mika had a question about the smaller city uh, i think mark you answered that one yes to comment on Mika's question regarding uh, if this is uh, transferable or replicable in a smaller city as well. Yes, so, comment well on that. so would you like to comment on that too, Leonard? Yeah, 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 just briefly, because I mean, the business model for easy to be now, it's for a dense area, urban area, but I mean, there are projects there that are working on rural mass. It's uh, so mass, Moss can be several things, but in the rural areas or smaller cities, maybe it's not carpooling. There it is car sharing, that's the, the main key. And for my mother who works in a rural area, I think that some kind of car sharing when she is not able to drive anymore, I think shared mobility has a, has a strong value even in, in those areas, but, but it's not the same thing that we're doing in uh, BRF Viva. Mm -hmm. okay. But would you say, Leonard, just, just to give a, a, a because I didn't really answer that question. I just said it would be very challenging. But would you say that the platform that EC2B has developed could be adapted easily to offering these different kind of uh, mobility services? And so, therefore, you you would be flexible enough to also move into those kind of projects. Yes, I mean that's uh, in our roadmap to like peer to peer and to share things and so forth. Right. Perfect. Thank you very much. And then we have a, a set of questions from Magnus Anderson, but I think we can have them at the very end. Uh, it, it's a, more of a general questions, um, but uh, maybe we can just, uh, he has four questions, but the last of them is, to, what is the, what, what are the most unexpected highlights from this work that you have conducted? Maybe Lennart, you would like to comment on that or, or Paraskevi or Mark uh, doing, using the yeah. yeah. but, but well. But, just just to mention one end user uh, you, you we, we are talking have, here about uh, replication and upscaling and we have made a replica in Västra Frölunda in Gothenburg where is a, a little bit less a lower lower income in these areas and we are working then with the property owner and we put in the uh, uh, bicycle sharing and we had it for three months and now we have removed it and we got such a nice letter now uh, fr from a, uh, a woman who said that we really like this service. We don't uh, we are we, we can't own a car, but when you put in now the car sharing and the bicycles, we have used it several times. When it is when is it coming back? Okay, I think it's it's, it's such a beauty, and uh, and that makes my work it, it's uh, <laughs> worth doing. You know it's. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That, always good to have that feedback from, from the group of uh, customers. Maybe they're not feedback otherwise when they are having complaints, but it's always <laughs> the best feedback is, of course, the praise. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, Magnus had three more questions, but I keep them to the very end of this uh, next session. Uh, and uh, Paraskevi, would you like to continue with the discussion on how to yes. capture value? 
Yes, uh, uh, we will, but I uh, have a just a, a general comment uh, on Magnus Anderson questions, which is about uh, also, which is also relevant to the last question um, that he raised. Um, it, the the thing about the smart city business model canvas is that um, it is so complex because the number of actors that are because of the number of actors that are involved in the process and then the, the different interests uh, each actor may have uh, in the offering of a smart city solutions that has to be satisfied taking also into account what leonard said the different conditions of the end users at the different districts in the city so um, this is uh, in itself quite complex. So the whole process, uh, of course, uh, is not simple in that respect. And uh, that um, might uh, hide uh, uh, some high unexpected highlights as Magnus is, uh, uh, is um, writing in his question. So um, let's move on to the third session, which is about capturing value. And uh, the first block, the first building block on this uh, stage is about the revenue streams. And of course, revenue streams uh, refers to the value which customers are willing to pay. Um, in the case of the smart cities, the public sector actors, of course, may have different uh, budget constraints. And the revenue streams for the city uh, can be broadened uh, to social value creation or to environmental value creation. So we are not talking about monetary benefits uh, alone, but also non-monetary benefits. And uh, if we want to link this with the case that we are uh, dealing with today, uh, I would like to ask Mark, for what value are the network beneficiaries willing to pay in the case of EC2B? And uh, if they are currently paying something relevant? Yeah, that, that's, that's always the, the, the bottom line question, let's say, uh, and, and very important. Uh, Leonard already referred to it, that it's important that uh, you prevent going bankrupt. Uh, that means you need to at least have more revenue coming in than, than costs going out. Um, and at this point, uh, it was interesting that one of the of the interviewees uh, said that the the business model is still on steroids, as he as he put it, in the sense that uh, a, a lot of uh, or a lot of, but at least money is going in, uh, more money is going in than uh, than than being uh, being captured. Uh, that doesn't mean that the value being created is not uh, sufficient to to carry the the costs. But at this point. Um, and this has to do with this, I think, this complexity also in time. Uh, property developers uh, negotiating parking rebates with the city uh, in exchange for offering uh, mobility services to their tenants. Of course, that is a, a, a very long, dragged out process in time um, where it's not really clear, uh, at least uh, in these particular two cases that we studied, um, uh, Gothenburg and Lund. It was not very clear what exactly uh, the additional uh, parking rebate was uh, due to having EC2B involved. Uh, so there was a negotiation between the property owners, property developers, sorry, and and the city about uh, parking rebates, and that generated uh, a, a cost saving for them, a significant, a very big cost saving for them. Uh, but but. To attribute that directly to EC2B is very difficult. Um, at one point, in, in one project, they came in from the beginning. At the at the other, it was later. Um, and even then, it's not it's not always clear uh, how much of the rebate could actually be captured by uh, EC2B as revenue. Um, so there is no payment in the current cases, at least as far as I understood. Uh, Leonard, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, from the property developers to uh, to EC2B, um, and TriVector is still, I guess, sponsoring and supporting it in kind, uh, in cash. I don't know exactly how those flows go, and perhaps that is also not that important. But it's clear that they are still supporting this as a as a, as an innovation, as a business development. Um, and Iris is putting in some of the some of the uh, the costs. So th that's the revenue streams uh, uh, currently uh, 
in, in play. Um, there's a cost saving for property developers that is not turned into a revenue stream for EC2B. And there is, uh, there is no revenue or cost streams for the end users uh, in addition to, I mean, they pay for the mobility service, but they pay the mobility service providers for doing that. And there is no fee paid by the either the end users or the, uh, uh, the service providers for the platform services. That, that is still, I think, um, let's say subsidized for them. Mm -hmm. So we, Leonard, maybe, how? Okay, sorry, sorry, Mark. <laughs> but you no, no, maybe things have changed. So if Leonard has additional perspective on that. Uh, yes, huh? I was also wondering how you plan this to make it sustainable in the future and after Iris, of course. Just say that Spotify is not making any profit. That's after several years. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it needs to have. <laughs> But, but uh, yeah, sorry. Um, the, the thing is um, that it is on steroids uh, yet, uh, but uh, in the new, uh, in our new projects, we are getting money for, uh, from the transport service providers and we're getting money from the end users that are using the services. So we are working now to, to make these revenue streams coming from different directions. To, to try to yeah to make it uh, a viable business model, but it's um, it's uh, it's still uh, that w that we need to put in money and in kind time it, time. So I'm really um, thankful for our uh, for Travector that they are doing this. But mm -hmm. but, but but I mean, ten seconds in Sweden at least parking. Places, parking, and cars are subsidized by the, the the property where you pay the rent. But there's a big movement now to exclude that the, the ones that are living in apartments should subsidize parking places. And when you do this, when you exclude this from the property and differs it, you can see that the, the revenue, the, the cost for the parking place is going to increase a lot if you want to have a car. And when we make a business model, it, you, it will become much cheaper for property owner to have shared mobility than than have a parking places. So there yes. is a shift. So often we say that shared mobility is expensive, but that depends on how you look at the, at the total. No, no. What what the property mm -hmm. developers told us that if 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 you really have to uh, calculate the, the the true price for parking. Uh, and compare that to the price of mobility as a service. Uh, you you could provide for 200 uh, residents uh, 10 years of mobility as a service at the cost of of only I think it was five parking spots or something. So it, it, that that trade-off is really beneficial. So once I guess you you make explicit to the tenants what they're actually paying for the parking spots of those who own cars. Um, then, then you uh, th then you would be in much better shape, and you can also tap that uh, tap that revenue. And I mean that 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 is a scale up for the whole of Europe, but because I, I guess it's more or less the same in urban areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's very interesting in uh, the prospects that this can evolve. And let's now move on the next one which is the budget cost which basically um, is a box that refers to um, what is the cost structure uh, what are the costs that are likely to be incurred by implementing this business model key activities and what is the cost of the key resources that are required and um, is there any difference for the specific uh, case that we are talking about in a smart city context, do we have a different cost structure here, Mark? It, 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 it was not so, um, but I think the, 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 the cost structure for ec 2 is, is not too complicated in the sense that it's, it, it costs a lot, well, let me rephrase that. Um, a lot of time, energy and effort goes into establishing and maintaining the relationships and building the high trust and, and talking to all the parties involved. So, so that is a, a difficult, I think, 
cost to quantify and it's also very difficult to recover uh, uh, on on the on the running um, yeah from the running revenues which are as we just discussed relatively very low so that's that it's very difficult but it's also something that is likely to drop significantly and these are let's say costs that you can spread over over many more projects to come uh, so in that sense it's not it, it, it's also not fair to um, to allocate those costs um, that are currently being made in the piloting phase entirely to these uh, to these two pilot projects. Um, so, so that's a difficult thing to quantify. Uh, the out-of-pocket expenses on these on these projects and the marginal costs per tenant are almost zero, I would say. Uh, you, you, you're, you're building up an infrastructure, you're setting up a platform, and once that's up and running, you have to maintain it. But the let's say the marginal costs are very low and you can uh, use that same solution in different contexts as Leonard already explained you can you can you can also sell it to corporate clients you can also implement it with different uh, mix of, of, of mobility services in, in other uh, developments in other areas so it's it's I think a lot of the costs uh, are fixed or semi-fixed and therefore, uh, um, yeah, it's difficult to, to to really connect costs to the service being provided uh, per project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, but we, the company, I mean, uh, we have to identify a cost structure in the end and uh, afterwards in the new business models that uh, it's going to create uh, in order to be um, uh, sustain viable, uh, let me use this word. Um, can we say, um, and the point of it, the point of this building block is that, can we say that uh, with the use of this specific tool, we, and uh, because we have identified all the key actors and uh, the role of each key actor in the business model, is it easier than to identify and blend funding, uh, public and private funding, uh, facilitating the collaboration in smart city projects in specific? So can we use this uh, from your experience and from conducting the work on the business model canvas, Mark, can, can we use this, the, the tool for identifying various sources of finance because of the actors that are involved and can bring some ideas on how to finance? Yeah, yeah, from, well, so currently the, the, the financing mix uh, um, and, 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 and carrying these budget costs uh, is, is as, we, as we just discussed when we were discussing revenue is, is is a mix of public funding, IRIS subsidies, and private uh, uh, funding, or at least support from tri-vector. From um, so so it's it it is a mix, um, but it's also not a, a a mix. I would I would base a long-run sustainable business model on uh, it, this. This funding is is I would say funding these uh, these fixed startup costs, these development costs, these piloting uh, efforts uh, it, and I'm, I'm I guess in the hope of at some point bringing those costs uh, significantly down while uh, uh, relying more on uh, private uh, funding uh, to support uh, the, the business model in uh, in the long run um, <laughs> Yes, it's it's possible to have a financing mix, but uh, public funding uh, is is typically um, more earmarked for, uh, let's say, short-term startup subsidies that end at some point and and not cover your uh, your long-run uh, mm -hmm. base base load costs. So we could say that uh, it can be used for kickstarting the project and then until it becomes more viable to continue in the future. Yeah, I think that would be at least from the Dutch context, uh, what I know about policy making, that would be a smart uh, approach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, um, um, as uh, we are running out of time, um, uh, I guess I will move to the next one. 
which is uh, the environmental impacts. And the environmental impacts uh, basically refer to um, the case where we are trying to reduce uh, any negative environmental impacts from the application, from the demonstration of a, a smart city solution, uh, or ensure that uh, there are environmental benefits that can offset any environmental costs. Uh, as, for example, the, crea the, the, the creation of uh, greenhouse gas emissions or the land use and the energy and water used from the installation and the operation sometimes, or the disposal of smart city solutions. So there are, some, there are always some environmental costs, but uh, also some environmental benefits. Uh, and in this case, in the EC2B case, what is the ecological cost or benefit? Mark. Yeah, so for these two cases that we investigated, they're, they're very s small in the sense, well, in the grand scheme of things, let's say. So the impact on the global climate uh, is, is going to be minimal, uh, but it makes, it makes a contribution. It, uh, it reduces the emissions for, uh, for, uh, for, the, for these people uh, providing their mobility services. Um, significantly, I would say, uh, at least for these people. So, but then it, the impact of the of the business model will have to come in the scaling. Um, that also holds for the costs, the environmental impacts, the negative environmental impacts of these uh, of of this business model are are very small uh, at the margin. So, it, mm -hmm. it's it's more in the promise. Uh, of what would happen if this if this solution would be adopted uh, more widely uh, than in the specific projects that we investigated. Mm -hmm. right. very, Thank you. very short yes, remark. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, yeah, we are, we are we are very seldom talking about the health. Uh, this with in, within active mobility, people. Uh, yeah, we made a survey that they weigh five kilos less. If you drive your own car, you weigh five kilos more than if you're using active mobility. So you could put in the health factor in these kind of services as well. That's important on a European scale, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, so it, 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 somehow you increase the quality of life uh, in the city uh, and at European scale if it, 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 when it will be replicated. So uh, uh, this leads us to the last one, the last box, which refers to the social impacts. And I know Jonas has appeared for the time, I think. So um, the last one refers to the social cost in terms of, uh, for example, the exclusion that may happen due to the inability to participate, the inability of some people to participate in the advanced smart city services because, for example, of illiteracy, digital illiteracy. Uh, and uh, what are the social benefits? This box helps us also to identify the social benefits uh, that can be created by a solution. As you mentioned, Leonard, the better air quality, uh, which leads to higher uh, quality of life, improved quality of life. And in this case, in the EC2B case, what is the positive or negative social value generated by the EC2B, Mark? Yeah, so it's notoriously difficult to quantify, uh, and, and also we did not get a lot of, uh, let's say, spontaneous uh, um, answers to that. So you really have to think about what what this would mean, um, and what it means in the in the exact prop uh, property developments. I think uh, it 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 is it is the, the the idea was that this would also lead to a community of sharing in in the in the buildings that um, that uh, that have that have this service and that is much less uh, the case uh, to to um, to date i mean coming from uh, from the from the tenants and from interviews with the tenants uh, there's also not a lot of negative uh, social impacts uh, Thinking about it myself, more recent, yeah, looking over the over the, the business model, I do think that this is um, more difficult to uh, to to reach, uh, let's say, low income uh, uh, households. Uh, Leonard already referred to another project they did, where he got that letter. Um, 
So maybe it, maybe I'm mistaken uh, there, uh, and I'm underestimating how uh, digitally advanced and, uh, uh, and and willing to engage with it, these kind of services uh, such such households are. But if if that is not the case, and this is really something that will be offered to property developers and property developers only implemented in let's say the higher segments of the of the. the the housing market then then of course this could create more uh disruption at the social uh, level but um yeah this this is not very clear from uh, from our interviews uh, i have to say it's more speculative so maybe then it can make some final remarks on that mm -hmm. Leonard, I think um it's a yeah, it's 11 o'clock, I guess. So th yeah. there's a lot of social impact and we could discuss that a lot more, but yeah, it's okay. For okay. Now. All right. So this, uh, there, there is a slide here on the replicability, which uh, is a topic that has arised quite a lot uh, during our discussion. And uh, you already mentioned, Leonard, that um, the initial business model uh, that has been conducted uh, like a few months ago is now being uh, replicated uh, to, to another case uh, with uh, different end users. And it, 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 we can say it is a different, it is a different business model. And uh, though you, I assume you have considered different aspects for the replicability. Um, and it can be either technical, financial, economic, uh, but uh, the most important one, I think, is the, um, the, 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 the stakeholders' uh, willingness to uptake uh, a solution, especially when we are transferring, uh, we are trying to replicate it in different uh, geographical contexts and uh, in different cultural contexts. Um, so, any final comments or concerns when you're trying to upscale the business in different uh, geographical areas, Leonard? I mean, when we talk about it, it seems to be so complex, but uh, as Richard Branson said, it's not hard to make things complex. Think uh, of it as easy instead and, and start doing it. Uh, the shared mobility is here, the technical side it's it's more or less here so let's do it okay thank you very much leonard uh, mark you can comment also on the replicability side of things um what would you say regarding this well if if if, if i have to um, reflect on that uh, and, and 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 i already so based on what we got from the from the analysis of the business model canvas uh, there's many partners involved there's many key resources that are very specific to these cases so uh, it's easy for me uh, as an outsider to be uh, let's say skeptical it's also a duty for Leonard to be optimistic yep. and try um i think i think uh, it, there are a few things that need to be in place there needs to be this political willingness at the city level there needs to be this ambition to to see uh, mobility as a service as as the part of the solution, uh, you, you can, I think you cannot be in a culture where uh, where car ownership is kind of uh, you know U.S. style wholly. Um, it, it would make it much more difficult uh, to 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 see progress with this business model. But I think in Europe, uh, Western Europe, maybe in particular, and and in cases where there is um, uh, strict uh, policy rules about uh, parking. Then, then this particular business model can can work. Uh, so for the Netherlands, I definitely see opportunities. Uh, how that looks in the other uh, partner cities in Iris, uh, I, I do not know. I don't know about the parking norms in Romania or uh, Greece or um, uh, uh, or uh, Veracruz. Um, but then there is pivots to this business model that can be considered and uh, can, so around the, the basic idea of having this platform service, uh, you, can, you can develop different ways of, uh, of value creation and capture. So in that Thank sense, I, I would have to do that. Yeah, sorry. No, no, no worries. I was just saying uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for, for, for the last comment because uh, uh, and, and maybe we just, just uh, 
make it quite explicit saying that starting this kind of business in Gothenburg, home of a large car manufacturer, is even more challenging and maybe starting in somewhere else in Sweden or Europe. So go for it. And I think Richard Branson will make it easy. I'm not sure. <laughs> Everybody needs a role model, so that's a good one. We started five minutes late, uh, so we will finish off five minutes late. Some, uh, like 20 people have dropped off during the conference, but uh, sort of the workshop, but I think it would have been very interesting. I think many people will maybe uh, watch the video and also take, uh, uh, take a deep, uh, deep dive into your uh, slide deck here as well. There is more questions from uh, Mika Hakosalo, but uh, I think maybe Mika, you can uh, be in touch with the presenter directly, and I leave over to Panos to finish off this workshop. Thank you very much, everybody. Hands up for for this distant meeting. Hmm? Panos, are you with us? Yes. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. As I said in the beginning, the, the video will be available and also I think the slides. So thank you all for participating and sharing uh, your experiences and stay tuned for the, our next uh, workshop or webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have thank you. Nice Take care, everyone. Take care of each other.